Thank you. Uh, welcome, welcome back. We know that lunch is on the way. Uh, and I'm here to tell you about our session in regulatory science. So let me start out. What the heck is regulatory science, you may be asking. Uh, first of all, it's science. Science is the discovery of new knowledge. And so it's about science. But there's that word regulatory. And the thing that makes it special is regulatory science is discovery of new knowledge that is important and will assist regulators in making better, faster decisions, regulatory decisions that get products, therapies, devices, innovation to patients. So that's an important goal. And so we are signed up for this. And in fact, for the last three or four years, I've had the pleasure of co-leading with Kathy Giacomini from UCSF, the UCSF Stanford Center for Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, or CIRCE. And the CIRCE program is a program created by the FDA. This is funded by the FDA to, and to encourage collaborations between scientists, and in this case at Stanford and UCSF, there are a few others around the country, who collaborate with FDA scientists to do knowledge, do knowledge discovery in order to help them in their mission. So this is very much mission-driven versus curiosity-driven research. The reason we get excited about it and the reason that the faculty have signed up for this is it's a unique opportunity to do science that is likely to impact regulatory decisions, um, guidances from the FDA in a very direct way. And therefore, it's among the most impactful research that's going on at the two institutions. So we've led this, the, the, the CIRCE, there's a nice web page, you can Google it, but we do three things. We do the collaborative research with FDA scientists f of, in regulatory science. We're doing education and workforce building to create a cadre of, of young people uh, who are excited about the opportunities in regulatory science. And I'm, I must say, I've been astonished by the level of interest of students at UCSF and Stanford in participating in our educational programs. And they're really starting to think about this as a pathway in their careers. And finally, and I think very importantly, we have an FDA visiting program where uh, for each year for the last three years, we've brought out about 30 scientists a year from the FDA to interact with the Bay Area community. Our community is a little different from the Beltway, as you might imagine. Uh, and therefore, we believe it's incredibly important for the FDA to be present here, to have interactions with our students and our faculty, and with local industry, all of which happens. So if that's interesting to you, please look at our website. You can find out more about it. But here's the key fact. Uh, many of you know that 25% of the GNP is regulated, of the United States, is regulated by the FDA. But more specifically, if you care about precision health, precision medicine, all roads to precision health and precision medicine go through the FDA. And so it is a non-optional partner in getting the future that you've been hearing about today. We academics can do a lot of research. If this is going to impact my patients, on the side, I'm a physician, I should say. Uh, if this is going to impact my patients, it's going to get, uh, the FDA will be involved. And therefore, you can't... Uh, underestimate the potential impact of this research. And so we've assembled a panel today from industry, government, so academia, that's me, to talk about some of the key issues. Uh, I'm really excited and I hope to get you fired up about regulatory science and its potential impact uh, towards precision health and precision, medi precision medicine. So uh, I will in, uh, introduce first our first speaker, which is who is Michelle Rohrer. Michelle is a senior vice president and global head of product development in regulatory science and policy at Genentech Roche. She has been employed at Genentech for 24 years, first as a postdoc, later a clinical scientist in their development organization. Then she joined the regulatory organization, uh, holding positions of increasing responsibility and finally global head in 2016. She writes a weekly blog for her staff, which is a considerable number of people. The San Francisco Business Times named her one of the most influ influential women in Bay Area business. Very significantly, in 2015, 2016, she was a member of the industry negotiation team for the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, or PDUFA. This is the um, every few years agreement between the FDA and the industry about how user fees will be collected and what they will be used for. And I think you might hear some of the things uh, in that agreement, which is still under legislative review. 
Michelle resides in Basel, Switzerland, uh, and has a pet lizard in addition to her children and family. So her title is Regulatory Science for Patients. Please help me welcome Michelle. Thanks very much. Thank you. I've had the great privilege to watch regulatory policy work become regulatory science and make a difference for the lives of patients around the world. I'd like to share a little bit of that experience with you today. One of those key experiences was the experience of building the breakthrough therapy designation, where industry, advocates, lawmakers, and regulators came together and created new regulation, which speeds the development, review, and approval of innovative, game-changing medicines. Now, I'm on a two-week business trip. Last week, I was in Malaysia, where I was meeting with our regulatory staff who work in the Asia-Pacific region. And one of the things that I'd like for all of us in this room to realize is that when we work on regulatory policy and regulatory science, it has impact that spans the globe. Because of the breakthrough therapy designation that we created, Countries around the globe are trying their best to speed review and approval of innovative medicines for their patient populations. And at our company, we've seen these review timelines dramatically reduce, and the approvals of innovative medicines come much closer in those countries to the U.S. approvals. Really game-changing work that we do in the policy space. Now, while I was there, I had an experience in my hotel room that I want to tell you all about for just a second. Go with me here. I heard the voice of a two-year-old crying out in the hallway. My hotel room was on the 35th floor. And it became apparent that as this two-year-old cried, that he wasn't crying because his parents had somehow locked him out, but he was in clear distress. So I opened the door. And he was right at my door. There was a housekeeper in the hallway. This two-year-old had dropped the luggage that he'd carted around and his shoes. And the housekeeper thought that the shoes belonged to him and that I was the child's mother. So the housekeeper came over and handed me the shoes. I said, no, 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 this child is not my child. Pretty soon, security arrived. The two-year-old was scooped up and taken downstairs to his parents who had lost him in the lobby. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because as I was on the plane coming here from Malaysia, I couldn't help but think that how often do we all go about our lives and have that experience of somehow ending up in a place where we didn't expect to be. So I'm gonna ask you all a question, and it's not how many of you have ever lost a two-year-old. <laughs> How many of you have been patients or have had a loved one where you've experienced your entry into the healthcare system and landed in that maze, completely discombobulating? And maybe even a healthcare professional came over and tried to offer you a solution and you knew it was not the right solution for you. And if you were very, very lucky, you were in that small percentage of population that Eric Topol talked about, where you were given a medicine that actually worked for you so that you could go back and resume the life that you had. This is our collective experience, and with the promise of big data, that matching of the right drug for the right patient at the right time so that we can go about living our lives becomes more and more a reality. Today, as I was prepping for this talk, one of the most fascinating conversations that I had were with the neurology scientists at our company. Well, they talked about neurology is really limited in terms of how we develop medicines for those conditions like Parkinson's, like Huntington's, like Alzheimer's. Limited because patients come into clinical trials, a neurologist or a healthcare provider does an exam, scores the exam, and creates a number. Well, as Jess talked about in some of the morning sessions, that number is a static number for that point in time. And maybe the disease is manifesting itself at that point in time, and maybe not. 
But today, we have tools like the smartphone apps that can really get a holistic 24-7 understanding. These tools can monitor whether the voice that you're using is affected by disease, whether your social encounters with others are normal or somehow affected. Whether your gait is affected, your sleep is affected, all of this data becomes so much more important for us to be able to think about how can regulatory science guide the use of this kind of data so that the clinical trials done with the innovative medicines of the future or of today really will show what the true benefit or value is of a medicine. It's a new world that we all need to venture into to create the regulatory frameworks so that this type of data can result in regulatory decision making. It will require what you see here in the middle of the slide, analytics. It will require us to discern truth, to understand what the bias is that comes into this type of data, which is different bias, different inferences than this type that we're used to dealing with in the typical placebo controlled trials. Now, as Russ mentioned, I had the honor of being selected to be an industry representative on the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which is now in Congress. It has passed the Senate. It's going over to the House at this point. PDUFA 6, as it's known, is the largest prescription drug user fee act in the history of PDUFA. It's the sixth. PDUFA started in 1992. This regulation that will become law Knock on wood, the president has to sign it. And this is important that all of these user fee acts pass because these user fees fund the FDA. They represent the majority of funding that FDA gets. And if this, these, this act, as well as a few other user fee acts, doesn't pass, there will be FDA scientists who will receive pink slips. So it's in all of our interest that these PDUFA, uh, this PDUFA 6 goes through the House, the Senate, and gets signed by the President. But what you see here are some of the major tenets of the PDUFA 6 agreement. I'm going to touch on two, learning from real-world evidence and improving FDA resourcing. It was a key tenet of the industry negotiators at the table that we build into the PDUFA 6 law ways that real-world evidence, real-world data could be used to enable regulatory decision-making, to make approval decisions on the basis of real-world evidence. But today, that framework doesn't exist. Yes, there are cases where real-world evidence have been used in the development of, of molecules and medicines, but, but not in the same tenet that, say, a placebo control trial is understood and all the framework that's built around that type of regulation. And so within the PDUFA 6 law, there are agreed to milestones and activities that FDA has to perform. They have to hold in 2018 workshops, much like this, where people from around uh, the different industries, academic institutions, advocacy groups would come together and start to talk about what are the challenges posed by use of real world evidence, both on the safety and the efficacy side, to make regulatory decisions. How does one control for bias? How do you want to articulate a draft guidance about telling sponsors how to develop these type of trials with all of this big data? So this is an important element of PDUFA 6. There is another element that I would say is equally, if not critically, important. And I bet you're wondering why in the world I'm showing you here the picture of the movie uh, advertisement for Hidden Figures. How many of you have seen this movie? How many of you recall that Kevin Costner, who headed up Mission Control and NASA as they were trying to get the first man on the moon, really needed a computational mathematician and he couldn't find one? And it was these powerful, influential, knowledgeable women that eventually he did find who he actually had right in his back door, but he found them and these women helped get the men on the moon. 
We have something similar going on in our line of work today, in the line of work around regulatory science and creating evidence that can be used for regulatory decision making. We do not have enough data scientists. We do not have enough statisticians in the talent pipeline to have at the regulatory authorities worldwide, people that we can sit across the table from and have this kind of dialogue. Yes, we do have statisticians there today, and they are wonderful partners. There's not enough of them. And so part of the PDUFA 6 agreement that we signed increases the FDA resourcing in fields, critically important fields like statistics, like clinical scientists, like biomarker development, but statistics is the field that I want to focus on here. I'd like to ask you all to join me in a call to action to really motivate young talent to go into the amazing field of statistics. We need these people that can work with us to identify how do you deal with bias? How do you deal with control of type 1 error? How do you deal with is it an association, or is this real-world evidence that's telling us about these patients really discerning truth that's actionable? And that when we're in that confusing world of being a patient, that by virtue of having talented statistical staff at agencies, that because of actions and decisions that those individuals made, that we would all be better off when we're in the healthcare system that then when a doctor or a healthcare provider identified a medicine for us, that it would be more than likely to be true that that medicine would actually help us and be safe and get away from what the charts that Eric told us about this morning. So I'd ask you to please join me in making FDA a cool place to work. As cool as Facebook, as Google, as Apple, it's possible and pretty soon here, you're going to meet some pretty cool scientists from FDA on the panel. But we need our young professionals to be interested in that. Because as the renowned statistician Douglas Altman said, research is changing. We're at the precipice of a very different data revolution. And we need individuals that can handle this complex data and discern truth. And that's almost like a whole new field of statistics that many of us can't even imagine. It's important that we venture there, that we seek to lean into these initiatives that the Bidufa 6 Agreement outlines, that we lean into these workshops that will be held on how do we deal with the challenges of real-world evidence with all of this massive data that can be, will be used to serve for the basis of regulatory decisions and the use of medicines. If we do that in the U.S., it will have ramifications for those people like I met with on my staff last week in Malaysia, where half of the world's patient population actually lives. We've seen it before where actions that we take in the US have global impact, make a difference for the lives of patients, make it better. And please join me in making statistics cool. in talking to your teenagers about that field. Yes, it's about STEM, but it's about specifics of statistics. Let's make it a cool profession. And more, let's make FDA an amazing place to work that talent wants to go to, because they have a venue, a platform, that none of us can possibly imagine. But behind the doors of FDA, is a really invigorating place because you get to see the world's medicines being developed and discerning truth for patients and making important decisions. So please join me in that call to action to create the statisticians of the future and a few years now when we come back to this conference that we all are recruiting patients, people rather, to go to FDA and serve us all. Thank you very much, and now I'll look forward to Russ introducing you to some of these cool scientists that I know from FDA.